This is the inaugural event for LILAC. Uh, so this is an initiative that's sponsored by the College of Humanities and by Circle. And in a moment, I'll be inviting the Dean of the College of Humanities to the mic, and he'll tell you a little bit about this um, from his perspective and be able to welcome you. Um, but on behalf of Circle and my colleagues there, um, I just want to say I'm very glad that so many of you have been able to join us on this Friday afternoon to talk and think with us together. Um, I do, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to address something that you yourself may have wondered uh, before I turn the floor over, and, and that might be, why LILAC? Um, and so to be perfectly honest, LILAC, this acronym, was at its outset uh, something of convenience. We had these ideas of trying to bring together literatures, language, and cultures, um, and we wanted to give it some sort of coherent front. And so we started looking creatively for acronyms. Um, and I will confess, we even uh, resorted to digital acronym generators. So there was a very non-human intervention into the creation of this. Um, and so on some, in some way, it was quite arbitrary. Um, and maybe that actually feels a little bit right in some ways. Um, there are people in our fields who have argued that the fact that literatures, language, and cultures even exist in these departments together is itself somewhat of a arbitrary thing, that it's sort of a, an accident of history of these fields that we've come together. Um, but here's the thing. Once we put it out there in the world, this lilac started to develop all these meanings. Um, it started locally in our office where we really couldn't help ourselves from resorting to flowery metaphors as we talked about the event. Um, and so things like come and see what we're blooming in the humanities or what's growing over in literatures, language, and cultures, and all kinds of um, really unfortunate poetic devices like that started to emerge. Um, those of you who've seen the advertising for the event will have seen that the lilacs have appeared in, in the imagery around the event as well. Um, we also were able to test the limits of our knowledge in that way when one of the flyers had flowers that were purplish, um, but one of my colleagues who's an expert in plant studies informed me that they were not, in fact, lilacs. Um, <laughs> Uh, to which I retorted they were indeed lilac because lilac is also a color. Um, so there was all this imagery around the color that emerged. Um, one of the people in our team expressed some concern that perhaps it was an overly feminine image, something we tend to avoid in university settings. Um, what kind of baggage of meanings was that carrying with it? Um, and another thing that happened was that people started to contact me to tell me all of the things that lilac represents out there in the world, all the different collective groups that through history and different places and spaces um, have used lilac or lilacs as a symbol for their groups. So we were taking all these meanings that we didn't even know existed in some ways. Um, so even though it started out quite arbitrary, I think in some ways lilac is maybe the perfect symbol for an event like this. Um, it's something that carries all these multiple messy sorts of layers of meaning. Um, and we saw the sign-up list and the variety of different fields and disciplines that are represented in this room. I think one thing that we do all share in common is this fascination, this interest, this concern with the complexity of meanings across a lot of different contexts. And so maybe not so arbitrary after all. Um, the fact that it is this empty signifier is also maybe perfect for an event like this, because in some ways what we're hoping to do is invite you today um, and listening to our speakers and our guests and thinking together about what might literatures, language, and cultures mean for us on this campus as we're going forward and what kinds of meaning might we put into that signifier as a group together. So welcome again. At this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to the Dean of the College of Humanities, A.P. Durand, who's going to welcome you, and then I'll give you some more um, practical advice about the rest of the event. So what I, I thought I would do, uh, instead of doing the usual uh, opening remarks, uh, I, I thought that I would give you like a few perspectives uh, uh, from our point of view on the topic of the conference, and I thought it was like a, a good opportunity to, to present some of the exciting things that our faculty uh, in the college and, and different uh, uh, departments, especially the language, literatures, and cultures uh, uh, departments, uh, have been uh, have been doing on this theme about 
the, the, the new uh, directions that, uh, that we are going uh, toward. So th this question of like why and what and how or do we need to change anything, right? This is kind of a, a, a starting point here at the university. We have this theme that our president, President Robbins, has been talking a lot about is this theme of the fourth industrial revolution, whereas, you know, in a world where modern technologies and the art tech is taking over, more and more it's, it's important and that's why it's so important to make sure that those machineries, they are still uh, being, uh, uh, that humans are still being in charge of them, right? And that's why the arts and the humanities, uh, they must be at the core, uh, at the core of that. Uh, another one is this uh, fact that uh, it used to be even higher than that. 64% uh, of Americans today uh, do not have a passport. Uh, I like to use this fact because I like to ask myself, and we, we have worked a lot about this with some of uh, uh, the colleagues in the college, is like, what about if this is our target audience, okay? So instead of focus on the others who have the passport, how do we convince the 64% who do not have a passport that it is important for them? Uh, even if they're never gonna leave Tucson, if they're, even they, 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 they always wanna stay in the United States, why is it still a good idea for them to know a second language and to study a, a second language? So really this idea about focusing on the skills, that's one thing that has been very important for us as opposed to, so when you learn a language, you know, you know how to speak that language, but that's not all you learn, right? You learn a lot more than that. And you learn those skills uh, that go with uh, the studying of a foreign language, a second language that are extremely important. Uh, so this idea about going from, uh, th this idea of the well-rounded citizen when, you know, in the past, like when I was a student, you know, that's some something you would often hear. Uh, why should you study the, the, the humanities? Because you, you want to be a well-rounded citizen. But more and more in all of the universities, we have this pressure about, you know, well, yeah, well-rounded uh, citizen, that's nice, but when you talk to parents, especially in high school, there is this idea about uh, well-rounded, yes, but also employed uh, citizen and, and, and global leaders uh, is another concept that, uh, that is important. So why the skills? And the good news for us uh, is that when you look at the, the, the literature out there, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, but the NACE survey is a survey that they publish that thing that is called the Job Outlook every year. And what they do is that they talk to all the main corporations in America and they ask them, what are the skills you are looking for when you hire your employers today? What are some of the things that they need uh, to know, uh, when, you know that, that are important to, to you? And if you look at those things that are listed uh, in here, those are the type of things that you, that you do study when you study the humanities and when you study uh, a second language. So again, when you're gonna be studying French or German or, or Russian or Spanish, you are going to have to deal with adaptability, with intercultural competence, uh, even with, uh, with critical thinking, communication, right? So those are the type of things that, uh, that we, have, uh, we have in mind here. Another one that is really good, is from the Qatar Foundation International. 97% of students who study abroad found employment within 12 months uh, of graduation. And then the, my favorite is this one. Uh, you may have seen this, uh, which is completely going against what we usually hear from the general public sometimes, you know, like you cannot get a job if you, if you major in a second language. Well, as you can see here, uh, this, is, uh, this is not quite like that, right? Graduates with degrees in foreign languages, literature, and linguistics are the least likely among all degrees and industries to be underemployed five years after graduation. So this is really this, uh, this idea, uh, the emphasis on the skills, that's one of the things that I think is very important, so that when we talk about second language and studying a second language, that we don't just talk about the proficiency that you're gonna have in the language, in the communication, but also all these other things uh, that so that if you go study abroad, for instance, you're gonna really increase your proficiency as well, but you're also gonna increase your intercultural competence, uh, your, ad your flexibility, your adaptability uh, to anything, really. So this is kind of, uh, of the, so part one, the skills. Part two is, you know, it's one thing for us to go to high schools and to, to carry on and to talk about, yeah, if you study a second language, you'll have a, it's gonna be great for your, for your kids. But if you can show like real people who have graduated from those degrees and show what they are doing and how successful they are, that goes a long way. So that's the, the second thing we have been really focusing on is to try to know our alumni, to try to reconnect with as many uh, of our alumni as possible. Because once we started doing that, and when we do that, we see that none of them uh, are unemployed. They are all employed in a wide diversity on career. Many of them use 
if they were of a second language major, they use a, 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 their language in their job, but not all of them do. We have a wide variety of careers that are presented. So what we started doing, we did that for the first time this year. Uh, we had 23 plus alumni and donors who got together here. From, they came from all over the country, people for, uh, that graduated in the College of Humanities, several of them in language, uh, the majority uh, in, in majored in the second language, and to kind of like together, work together on those questions, you know, how can you help us making that connection, for instance, with the, the different uh, uh, industry that exists, and how can we connect our students uh, for internship, for instance, or for articulating those skills that they, that they have and that they can present when they are looking for a, uh, for a job. So we, you know, this is another example of like, we, we try to meet with as many of the, of the alumni as possible. And then uh, the, the promoting what we are doing and those skills is extremely important. So that's another thing we have been doing. We have a fantastic uh, team, marketing team uh, in the college. And they have helped us, you know, spreading the message. So the, we are very active on social media. And also, this is like a, a, a billboard that we, uh, that we did uh, uh, this year. But to convey this idea, or again, connected that the skills that we teach and that you will learn in a second language, they are very marketable uh, for any type of, of industry. Those skills are in demand as, prov as proven by, the, by the, the, the evidence that is out there, those statistics that I, that I showed. Uh, so telling the student story and the alumni stories is very important. On the website, we try to feature uh, many of those students, and those are by far the most visited uh, sections of the website uh, because students want to know uh, what is it that, uh, that you can do if you major in a second language. So I will show you very briefly a couple of examples of, of what we have done featuring the, the students. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and my family migrated from Mexico to the U.S., so in our household we only spoke Spanish. I am currently studying Spanish and physiology. I want to be a physician. I want to be able to use Spanish in rural communities. When I attended the University of Arizona, I didn't know medical terminology. Majoring in Spanish, I've been able to actually learn the terminology in Spanish, so it gives me the upper hand here in this clinical research lab that I'm working in currently. We have several examples from current majors and that also from uh, alumni. At my previous undergraduate institution, German was not offered as a major, it was only a minor. So when I transferred to the U of A, it was to major in German studies. The more languages you can speak, the more friends you can make. I can honestly tell you that some of my best friends in the whole world I would not be able to be friends with if I didn't speak German. So for me, in a perfect world, everybody can speak at least two or three languages. But in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to hear. So if I can get my patients hearing everything they need to hear, you know, they can just go out and pick up whatever languages they want and that way be able to have that much richer of a life and interact with that many more people. Here at Children's National Health System, we see a lot of kiddos from a lot of different backgrounds. The emphasis that humanities places on understanding other cultures and cultural differences has really helped me to be a more sensitive clinician. For all the, the, the different languages that we, we teach, we, we have uh, something similar like that. We feature different uh, uh, students and, uh, and alumni, so there are more that you can see on the, uh, that land page, uh, choose uh, Humanities Arizona uh, EDU. Uh, and then the other thing, so this is just an, one example, like it's at the start, but there are you know, a lot more people, we could not just put everybody there. But the, what I want to emphasize too that we have been doing that is very important is to have a structure when it comes to like uh, uh, recruiting the students and promoting uh, the second languages that we have uh, or that we offer, the type of languages that you can study, including as a major. So we, we have a recruiter, we have a director of special projects, advisors at the college level, and then in every unit, they are, of course, you know, language advisors and faculty, and all the units will have some kind of a structure that they adapt to the specificity of their own department to really talk to the students and to make sure that the students who have a high level, especially those students that arrive here at the U of A with some AP credits who are already uh, able to start at the, at, the, at the fourth semester level or fifth semester, that none of them go through without talking to us, right? So that's, uh, that's extremely important to have a structure uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, so some of the results that, you know, just uh, the, the bragging part, this is the, from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, this is for the year 2017. 
uh, the foreign languages degrees produced in the United States. So the number of degrees in foreign languages that were produced, and the U of A was number one in Italian, uh, fourth in Russian, fifth in Spanish, and uh, seventh in, in, uh, in German. Uh, and, and so these are, are some of the, the increase that we have been uh, uh, showing. Now, this is all majors. It's not just languages. It's all majors, but we have a majority of language majors in the, in the college. Uh, and then the number of students that, are, that arrive, incoming freshmen that arrive in the college to study uh, a major, in, including, uh, obviously, uh, a major in, uh, in second, uh, second language. So these are some of the, these are some of the things that, uh, you know, we have been doing to approach this idea of like what are some of the things that, that we need to do to, to, to in thinking in terms of like curriculum, promotion. One part that I didn't have time to, to go over, but I'm sure it will come up in the conversation, is a lot of the units, the second language units in the college have been working on looking at their curriculum, at the requirements, are making some changes uh, here and there uh, according to what they see uh, is needed, but really across the board to have this conversation. So which is great to have this, uh, this symposium, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Exactly what we're hoping to do today is to build off of that momentum that already exists on this campus for thinking and rethinking um, how we're approaching the teaching and the learning of languages, literatures, and cultures, um, and how that is also embedded with our research. So really quickly, and then I want to get to our two um, speakers, just a couple of kind of points of procedure for today. Um, so we will hear first from both of our invited speakers. I think as many of you or all of you know, um, Jillian Lord unfortunately was not able to join us. Um, we're still seeing if maybe we can bring her back in the spring to talk with us. Um, so you'll hear more about that later. Uh, and then we're going to have time for a Q&A that will be directed around the two presentations. And then we're going to make you work if you're willing to stick around with us for a little longer um, by moving into breakout sessions. And those breakout sessions can be tied to what the two speakers offer us as starting points for thinking, or they can be other things that emerge. Um, so we've set up this uh, Padlet, and you should have received an email, and you may have seen the QR code out there. Um, and so if you have things that just kind of get you excited, please do go ahead and post them, even if it's just a thought or a concept. Um, and Kate has the QR code again if you need it and want to scan that with your phone. Uh, and we'll be collating those ideas. So if there are other groups that kind of emerge, we'll create tables for them. So there's sort of an unconference element to that breakout session part. Um, and then we'll have a reception, at which point we will have earned that. I think, as well. So that's how things are going to look. Um, we'll go ahead and get started now with um, our two speakers. Um, first, uh, Domna Stanton, who is professor of French at the City University of New York. Um, she's a very renowned scholar in um, 17th century um, French studies and early modern French studies and feminist theory. Um, she's also notably uh, was a former president of the Modern Language Association and was the first female editor of the PMLA, the publication of that organization. Um, but she's also in more recent years uh, taught and written on the subject of international human rights uh, and her work um, in really inspiring ways extends beyond the campus in this area. Um, and just to sort of cite one aspect of that, she was appointed as a commissioner, commissioner of New York City's Human Rights Commission. Um, and so she's going to share some of her work and the initiatives she's been doing on her campus um, to try to, to really move towards transdisciplinary approaches to literatures, languages, and cultures. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Stanton. I want to thank Chantel Warner for inviting me and Kate McKay, who has arranged my visit so carefully, thanks to the dean who um, is, uh, is uh, certainly setting us off on this motivational uh, path, which I hope to uh, certainly follow in. Um, I hope that this is going to turn into a lively conversation this afternoon about the complex situation in which languages, literatures, and cultures find themselves, and the suggestions that we students, faculty, and administrators can make to enhance our programs the humanities, and thus the university as a whole. Is this okay? Am I getting, a little yeah, louder. a little louder? Don't know how to do that, but okay. Okay. So I don't have to remind anyone here that literature, language, and culture departments, more broadly the humanities, have been in crisis for some time. Uh, though the term crisis, of course, implies that the state will end at some point, which is not yet foreseeable. 
We're facing significant changes in the academy and in our fields, and we need strategies for confronting them and for modifying our practices productively. For U.S. higher education as a whole has adopted an ideal of professionalization and by extension a business model for evaluating liberal arts education. Faculty are sometimes viewed as content specialists whose courses should become the institution's intellectual property. The model's ideal of efficiency assessed by outcomes has increased the workload of faculty and chairs and dramatically enlarged the number of administrators hired relative to faculty faculty now dominated by adjunct instructors for perceived short-term financial benefits. A very quick comparison, whereas in 1975, 70% of the faculty held a full-time position and well over half held tenure. Today, 50% of the faculty hold a part-time appointment and only 29.8% are on the tenure track. We're facing significant changes in the academy and in our fields. Uh, And as I said a moment earlier, uh, we uh, certainly need strategies uh, for uh, uh, confronting this. Uh, In this connection of this dominance of adjunct faculty, one of the problems is, of course, is that uh, for perceived uh, short-term financial goals, uh, those working within departments uh, and for the institution's long-term good are fewer in number. For after all, why should adjuncts devote their time to mentoring students or serving on committees when they don't know if their annual contract will be renewed? This this model and its implementation by state legislators in Florida, North Carolina, Texas, especially Wisconsin, may be politically driven, but they do tap into justified anxieties of families about the costs of a four-year liberal arts education, which ranges in New York City this year from 7,180 for in-state students at Hunter College to 61,850 at Columbia University, thus for four years, $28,720 versus $247,000. And further, anxieties, as the dean has mentioned, about the employment prospects of graduates saddled with death, death, not debt, death, uh, that rises exponentially for PhD students. Uh, Justified concern about the lack of employment for humanities graduates, I'm delighted that the dean has cited some contrary evidence. Let me cite a little digression, a piece that appeared in the New York Times on uh, September 22nd by David Deming, uh, in which he sees the advantages for STEM majors fading steadily after their first jobs, and by the age of 40, earnings of people who majored in history or social science have caught up. The reason, he argues, is that technical skills are quickly obsolete, but, as in the dean's list, problem solving, critical thinking, good written communication, and adaptability to work in a team, philosophy and literature majors who can read closely and analyze a broad range of texts together have these skills so that these areas have long-term value in a wide range of careers and that employers consider important. We can come back to that uh, certainly later, but it's an important counter-narrative uh, to the one uh, usually in the, uh, in the press. Um, part of the concern, however, about lack of employment has led to the defunding of humanities programs and thus the decline of majors across the humanities, which is documented in the teaching of the arts and humanities at Harvard College 2013. But as Michael Berube has shown, this report's graph does not support that conclusion of decline. Instead, enrollments in the humanities rose from 14% in 1966 to 18% in 1970, then fell precipitously, recovered somewhat in the late 80s and early 90s, and have remained essentially the same, hovering between 7 and 10%. And when Anthony Grafton and James Grossman set the baseline even further back in a piece called The Humanities in Dubious Battle, enrollments peaked in the 1960s, were at much lower levels in the 40s and 50s, and returned to those levels around 1990, where they have stayed ever since. A large fluctuation with a bubble in the middle, not a story of decline, thus a misreading of the data that has become truthiness, as Colbert would put it, through repetition. This narrative of decline has been cast by pundits such as David Brooks as the fault of the humanities themselves who in the heady theory days, according to his narrative, retreated into elitist, rarefied, 
but somehow also politically correct subjects and incomprehensible jargon, a criticism of excessive technicity that is, of course, never leveled at scientists. In the humanities fields that concern us, what I call languages, literatures, and cultures other than English, I don't like the term foreign, so I call them LOTE, L-O-T-E. The latest MLA survey does indeed suggest enrollment declines in German, Spanish, French, Italian, and Portuguese from 7 to 20 percent, and a decrease in majors as well. But the more promising figures for LOTE in general, French in my case, is second majors, or double majors, which are steadily rising in relation to single majors. The 2015 MLA survey concluded the double majors in LOTE rose from 28% of the number of single majors, majors in 2001 to 38.6% in 2013, and that this percentage exceeded that of double majors in the next most populous field, which was by psychology, exceeded it by 25.2%. For French, this means that whereas there were 2,377 single majors in 2001 and 2,284 in 2013, thus a decline, the number of double majors rose from 869 to 1249 in that period. This trend, along with the rise in minors and certificates, which I believe will persist in the foreseeable future, provides yet another reason for rethinking the major and making it more appealing and challenging to students and to faculty in other departments. In the wake of new developments in the field of LOTE, which the two of us are addressing today, in my case it's going to be refugee studies, I want to urge us to consider the basic idea of renaming our department away from the hierarchical binary French language and literature to French studies. So doing to re reflect the increasingly inter and transdisciplinary nature of our departments already represented in our current readings of texts where we integrate philosophy, history, arts and visual media, cultural anthropology, psychoanalysis, law and medicine, among other interdisciplinary fields, such as women, gender and sexuality studies, and ethnic colonial and post-colonial studies. A name does make a difference, signaling emphasis in the curriculum and pedagogy, our range of possible hires, joint hires, even what we consider relevant theory beyond our departmental boundaries. Naming also figures importantly in the course titles we present to the rest of the humanities and the institution at large. Rather than the traditional coverage of great books in century courses, which is now frankly an impossibility with the expansion of the canon, why not a 19th century course on money and the novel, a 17th century course on the enemy, a seminar on the Middle Ages featuring encounters with others, including there, for example, texts on map making, travel narratives, religious pilgrimages, and convergence. So doing, we can reach students having in those three courses in economics, political science, and the development of international relations, religion, and geography. This is not the selling out of the humanities. It is, as the dean was demonstrating, advocating on behalf of the humanities the wide range of studies in LOTE. Our collective failures to advocate for the humanities to overcome the insularity of LOTE is a long-standing problem, but it is now a critical issue if we want to ensure a viable and vibrant future for our departments. And I would say here that one of the things that we need to do beyond the alums and all the rest of it is address state legislatures, especially uh, if we are a public university. They hold the key to the money. In this context, we should not regard STEM, those fields single-mindedly promoted in educational policy today as the humanities nemesis. Close observation and deduction from evidence are strengths in our own modes of inquiry. Conversely, our skills can be critical to the training of scientists. A friend of mine teaches poetry to psychiatry interns at Weill Cornell in New York because doctors want their students to deepen their capacity to discern subtle meanings from patients' narratives. I endorse the view that scientific literacy must be a feature of 21st century education, and we in French, for example, could develop a course on the history of science, from Descartes to Curie and Monod, without ignoring that history's blind spots and biases. Moreover, we should also promote a shift from STEM to STEAM, 
Arts and Design, as the Rhode Island School of Design promoted. And I would argue, it's not very pretty, but I'm going to argue it, a shift to STEAM with the H for the humanities. Not very mellifluous, but it does integrate the humanities in this dominant educational paradigm and its connection to the STEM fields. We should aim to mobilize humanities organizations such as the Mellon and the NEH to fund and promote STEAM. Sounds good, actually. Sounds more forceful than STEAM. Beyond the social and natural sciences, I would urge us to forge interdisciplinary links with professional schools on campus. Academic ties between, say, pharmacy and French, Spanish and nursing, German and engineering, Italian and design, and frankly, any load and public health. And then there is the business school, with its dominant emphasis on internationalism and globalizations, which seems an obvious partner for a Lotte alliance. The ability to focus on a text or a problem and intense dialogic analysis is the progressive model for collaboration in the business world of the future, and we already do this in our classes. Corporations recognize that they must employ people who are sensitive to the differences of others, an ethical skill that both Martha Nussbaum and Anthony Appiah remind us literature teaches exceptionally well. And if it is true that since 2005 we have already been moving beyond the knowledge economy, which the internet and other technologies provide, to a creativity economy that taps the imagination to produce innovation, that is our turf. I hope, in fact, and let me refer you here to an article that Bruce Nossbaum wrote in Bloomberg News precisely about this uh, point. He writes, increasingly the new core competence is creativity. It isn't just about math and sciences anymore. It's about creativity, imagination, and above all, innovation. Now, it can be a gimmick, you know, a marketing gimmick. I get that. But we can also capitalize on the gimmick to the good of our departments. In any case, I hope in the discussion after our two talks that you'll tell us about your own initiatives uh, and indeed the ways in which perhaps uh, uh, either through uh, second majors, uh, either through interdisciplinary alliances, alliances with professional schools, um, the humanities can become a more vibrant part of the community at large. Before I shift to the particular curricular, scholarly, and theoretical interdisciplinary focus of my talk, which is critical refugee studies, I want to say something about uh, the work of Gillian Lord in the digital <coughs> humanities, a field, as you know, that features the production of archives, new modes of textual analysis and data sets, and new approaches to the materiality of the book, work that has led most recently to a $300,000 grant from the NEH to the MLA and Columbia University to develop the Humanities Core, an interdisciplinary repository that will include syllabi, conference presentations, white papers, and other materials in a library quality archive. And for Charlotte Malin's impressive work in the environmental or sustainable humanities, she's the editor, as I'm sure um, you will hear, of the important foreign language teaching and the environment. Um, she is educating all of us about the major global threat of our times, a field that has evolved remarkably since the 1990s, in part with her help, and grown in sophistication from the study of, you remember, nature and literature, or literature and nature, to intersect now with the biological sciences, the new geography, animal studies and the post-human, the Anthropocene, and the links between environmental degradation, neoliberalism, neocolonialism, and the massive problems of the global south. This field will introduce a much needed environmental literacy in higher education and can mobilize each of us to combat the destruction of the planet's life as we know it. Now, there's a clear link between this planetary crisis and the refugee crisis, the most pressing humanitarian crisis of our time. A recent study suggests that 108 million people are now affected by climate change, a figure that rises to 200 million annually with its exponential effect on global distractions. Today, 70.8 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide. Of these, 41.3 million are internally displaced, 25.9 million are refugees, half of them, half of them children, 3.5 3 million 
are asylum seekers, and it won't surprise you that the U.S. has the highest number of unprocessed asylum seekers, now numbering 671,900. Beyond Syria, the major current crisis is Venezuela. As you know, since 2016, 4 million have left their homes, often fleeing in neighboring countries, which have thus become destabilized, Colombia and Brazil most notably. The failure of a political solution to this crisis, as the High Commissioner of UNHCR said to a group of us at a meeting this week in New York, could well catalyze a set of regional conflicts for years to come. Am I still, am I talking loud enough? Okay. In the time I have, I want to talk about this crisis, specifically the notion of critical refugee studies. I should explain that after I announced a PhD seminar so entitled, and I'd be happy in the Q&A to talk to you about the st structure and approach in the seminar, I discovered that Yen Le Espiritu, a colleague at the UC San Diego campus, had already coined that name. She works particularly on Vietnamese and Native and Pacific studies, so I obviously contacted her, hope we could collaborate for a session at last year's MLA. It didn't work out, but I hope to see her in Seattle at the MLA uh, this year. So there's not just one of us, there's clearly more than one, herself included, and I think others. I should begin by explaining something that Chantel mentioned. I've been involved in human rights work since the 1990s, when I joined the board of Human Rights Watch, and discovered, this is the important part, that because of my work in critical theory, I could bring a different mode of analysis to human rights, the human rights regime. This led me to create a track in human rights in the PhD program in French at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. To mount a conference, I co-chaired with Judith Butler on human rights in the humanities, 2006. To participate in the National Humanities Center three-year project on human rights and the humanities and to write essays as well uh, on uh, various topics, including linguistic human rights. I bet most of you don't even know that they exist, but they do. Um, and as Chantal mentioned, I served on the Human Rights Commission. For the last nine years, I want to tell you about my work on the Board of Scholars at Risk, which has created a network of some 550 universities to help get so scholars out of conflict zones and find them short-term positions in universities in the West where they can continue their work. I wonder, is the University of Arizona a member of Scholars at Risk? Dean, perhaps we can discuss that. <laughs> okay. I say all this because this is important for graduate students. You can't ever predict how non-academic, non-profit work turns into academic work. You, know? you sort of have to invent it as you go along. And as I once said to a graduate student whose um, who's thesis topic, my colleague said he'd never, ever get a job. He was working on female fairy tales in the 17th century. Uh, I said to him, after a sleepless night, you've got to go with the passion. He has been a brown ever since, in any case. What I mean to say is you can't ever predict this, so go with what you care about. By now, every college and university in this country offers some course in human rights, certificates and minors, uh, uh, and including in humanities departments, that's recent, with the rising importance of economic, social, and cultural rights, whereas in the past, human rights was housed in international relations, political science, and the law. I'd be interested to find out what you're doing in human rights on this campus. So too, I believe that we humanists can confront the refugee crisis and analyze it through the tools at our command. First and most basically, by reading the, uh, and integrating into our courses the large number of literary texts that have appeared and are appeared, written by refugees, testimonials and memoirs, novels and narratives, poems and plays. But also by bringing a vigilant uh, uh, look through critical theory whereby we can deconstruct the narratives and ideologies embedded in constructions of the crisis. This emerging field seems very relevant to the University of Arizona, I would dare say. I noted on websites the important work on refugees that's being done in Tucson by the Tucson IRC, which helps asylum-seeking families, the Migration and Refugee Services, services, which focuses on job readiness and training for adults, transportation, housing, and short-term financial assistance to new refugees here, and 
forgive me if I mispronounce the word, the Iskashitaya, is that right? Re- sorry? Again? Thank you. Uh, Refugee Network, where words to integrate UN refugees into the Southern Arizona Committee, and in particular, I like this a lot, to strengthen the local food system, eliminate waste, and increase food security. So how connected is the university to this work? And would this be a good can- candidate for community, academy, collaboration, and alliance? Now, who or what are refugees? The term, you'll be surprised to know, and not, that's not because I'm in French, the term dates back to 1685 during the Huguenot diaspora, believe it or not. It appears early on about those um, diasporic Huguenots in a text by William Defoe in 1707, where he pleads for them. Again, the cliches are absolutely the same as we find today to explain why, why he, we should have them in good for England and all of that, as opposed to the image of the, of the refugees. It was also, you'll be surprised to know, deployed by Lincoln, President Lincoln, in relation to some 200,000 Southerners who had been left homeless during the Civil War. And correlatively recently, by Brian Stevenson, do you know who he is? He's the one who really founded the lynching museum in Alabama, he's a wonderful writer. But on NPR in 2018, he referred to the six million blacks fleeing the South during the decades of terror, torture, drownings, and lynchings following the abolition of slavery as refugees. Not the Great Migration, Great Migration, refugees. And more recently, indeed, uh, refugees, uh, the term was invoked by Yenle Spiritu uh, to refer to the tens of thousands of Katrina victims in 2005 uprooted from their homes and forced to flee in search of rescue. I mention that because we think of, you know, this happened like starting in 2015. No, it didn't. It's been going on for hundreds of years. In contrast to this expansive understanding, the UN definition is based on the 1951 Refugee Convention established in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust to which the document, the convention, actually refers. This definition predicates, I'm quoting, a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership, uh, and so forth. Moreover, I'm going to paraphrase now, moreover, refugees in the convention are outside of their country of nationality, are unable or unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country, or who not having a nationality and being outside the country of their home or habitual residence are unable or unwilling to return to it. Chapter 1, Article 2. While we do see certain cases today of persecution, the Rohingya come immediately and appallingly to mind, the convention does not consider non-persecution cases of blight, such as environmental catastrophes that lead to famine, poverty, homelessness, nor to internal displacement. It does not even mention asylum-seeking or non-state actors as causes of terror and flight. Think ISIS, non-state actors. Unfortunately, there seems to be no realistic possibility of arising the convention to grapple with the crisis of our era, but even in its problematic current form, its substance is constantly ignored by signatories, such as members of the European Union, Hungary and Italy most notably, and of course the U.S., all of whom are openly founding, flouting the fundamental principle of non-refoulement, that is, forced repatriation. Even more broadly, the refugee regimes, and by that I mean the body of documents, conventions, international laws, working papers, uh, reports by regional and national governmental and non-governmental organizations, it's a very large body of text, does not examine the ways in which refugees have been and are being used as a foreign policy tool. For instance, during the Cold War, the U.S. championed Vietnamese refugees because they could be deployed as, in fact, a rejection of communism. Indeed, our government and others, think Russia and this, in the Syrian conflict, keep silent about the wars and conflicts in which we, they, have been involved that have helped to produce the environmental degradation, the precarity, the poverty and despair that lie at the heart of displacements and migrations around the world. By the way, statelessness, which we now again see a rise of, radically calls into question uh, this this whole um, notion of the nation state and its ideals 
of inclusion and recognition within it. And further, uh, uh, what, I, uh, what I'm trying to focus here is that if we shift our focus not to the immediate crisis but to the longer-term causes of it, we'll see that we need to consider the global historical conditions that produce the di- displacements in the first place. And that narrative is usually silenced, erased, it doesn't exist. Um, what I would also argue, and that uh, the, the dominance of the nation state and its citizens in the refugee regime uh, functions in denial of the humanitarian law that the, day, the state is bound to protect the rights of its residents, farms, and aliens, the so-called RTP conventions about which, I don't know, volumes and volumes have been written. But earliest, Hannah Arendt recognized in The Origins of Totalitarianism that people have no human rights if they are outside the nation state. Today, terror threats in the U.S. and elsewhere are invariably ascribed to Muslims, the brown people, and never to the white supremacist or the alienated, disaffected white male adolescents who have, uh, who have indeed perpetrated uh, so many massacres at home. I should say that the new directive for the Department of Homeland Security, I just saw it in the paper uh, in, the, in the New York Times today, does indeed uh, talk about rethinking ca- ter- counterterrorism and in fact finally talks about white supremacy and uh, white uh, terror. But for too long, Muslims have become the pariah of the New World Order, the spectrally inhuman, what Judith Butler calls the abject. Their religion and swarthy color have endangered, have engendered the narrative among millions, that among millions and millions of refugees, one or two might be terrorists, fear-mongering that has legitimated increased state surveillance and violations of our freedoms. That's the other thing. It's not only the the larger historical global causes of all of this, but it's also when you have a crisis, what does that facilitate? And I would argue that it has certainly increased state surveillance and violations of our freedoms, which we all tacitly accept. Uh, In Michel Foucault's term, heightened securitization. This has also legitimated the abandoning of European values, including its asylum and refugee laws. Europe and the U.S. have now created a border imperialism, I would argue, certainly in contravention to the ideals imprinted on the Statue of Liberty and the very idea of a European Union that was to be borderless. People have started making the case for open borders. Uh, The model, by the way, would be the non-existing boundaries between cities, provinces, or states in the American sense. You don't need a passport to go, you know, from here to, I don't know, Illinois. Think about that. Why is it that that's okay to enter? It's got its own laws uh, to enter those that border. Why could we imagine a world in which uh, not you know borders basically um, did not exist? That was the uh, goal of the European Union, at least for the original 29 countries. And with that, with the loss of that, this this thinking about. Uh, no borders, at least within the European Union, um, goes also the ideal of hospitality, I would argue, an ideal from Kant to Derrida, for welcoming the stranger, the face of the other, as Levinas would say, heralded in every major religion. We accept today the existence of refugee camps in which those desperately fleeing global and local confines are confined. Effectively, they are detention, I would argue even concentration camps. Not death camps, but concentration camps. And these in, uh, camped refugees are predominantly now families who on average, I bet you can't guess, spend how many years in a refugee camp? 17. That's the average number of years in a refugee camp where they are not allowed to work. That too, in, this, in the recent... Uh, refugee global compact that the uh, High Commissioner of Human Rights spoke to us about, they're now trying to recognize that they're going to have to do something about work. Uh, Because without work, we know in camps there is depression and despair, not to mention, of course, other uh, terrible symptoms such as sexual violence. 
It is easy then to denounce authoritarians in the U.S. and Venezuela, Italy and Hungary, Syria and Myanmar, who demonize refugees. The question is, what is our complicity, our own complicity, in the representation of refugees as objects of suspicion, of threat, anomalies, the uprooted, the out of place, who suspended liber liberties, even what Agamben calls their bare life, we tolerate or shield our eyes from really seeing. Does our concept of the human truly include refugees whose crime was to flee violence and enter our territory when we supposedly believe in the freedom of movement? Within this crisis, which signals the failure of a civilized world, there are some positive signs with which I want to end. You know, that's what you do in a talk. You're really late on, then you try to find something positive to say at the end. But as anyone who has met or worked with refugees knows, they are survivors. They're resilient, they're productive, they're even heroic. They're not passive, incapacitated objects of rescue by the Great West, as media depictions show on the one hand, and on the other, fear them as dangerous and violent. No, they have agency and they resist. Too often, the stories of resistance are absent. You really have to look for them uh, in the press. In many sites, for example, refugees have refused to languish in camps and have gotten out into urban centers where they cobble together work, and there their children can finally go to school, because that's the other thing. No education has been allowed in refugee camps. I met a refugee, an Iranian refugee in Slovenia or Slovakia, I can't remember which, who has a PhD. Her topic was Gertrude Stein, and she offered the camp, whatever you want to call them, guards, monitors, um, that she could just, didn't want to get paid, she would just hold, um, you know, free classes to teach people English. And they said, no, it was not allowed. So uh, the problem is uh, no, no work, and no education for children. Think about it, 17 years, th think, think if you're born in a refugee camp, and within 17 years, 17 years, you have had no education. What do you become? Radicalized? Uh, do you become a productive member of society? How? You have no tools. So the generation that we're breeding as a result of this is really rather uh, terrifying. In any case, now there's more possibilities. This urban refugee phenomenon has been recognized. Uh, in Jordan, for example, uh, is doing a good job. We also see some camps now promoting work for refugees and building relations with the neighboring communities to reduce inevitable hostilities. The best, you'll be surprised to learn, is Uganda's Bidibad camp. Who knew? I had a student who did a very long study of the Bidibad camp. It houses 270,000 South Sudanese refugees in northwestern uh, Sudan. By the way, last year, the largest refugee camp in the world became Kutapalong for the displaced Rohingya in Bangladesh. So more than 270,000. In recent years, scholars have highlighted some areas of effective refugee resistance. I'm getting to the end. Raffaella Puglioni, for example, rejects the notion that the refugee detention center is an Agambenian space of absolute subjection and documents Albanian refugees' acts of dissent as sites in Bari where refugees achieved safe changes in the regulations that constricted them. In Chiaro Denaro's essay, Agency Resistance and Force Mobilities, shows that Syrians in transit through Italy in 2013 and later overcame restrictions imposed by the Dublin regulations. Those are, that's the European law that determines which European member state is responsible for examining your asylum application. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the Syrians in transit refused to provide fingerprints during identification because that would determine the only country that they could go to claim asylum, so they said no. And you know what? They organized hunger strikes, developed relationships with activists and volunteers, and successfully negotiated with police and other stakeholders. These are, to use Foucault's term, counter-contacts, a notion that must be extended to the refugees who gra write graphic novels, make documentaries, speak, and act up. In this slide, I urge us to consider Talal Jalal's recognition that the growing mass of humanity 
is no longer representable entirely inside the nation state and that we should imagine the refugee rather than the citizen as the basis of our political juridical framework, indeed the vanguard of our world order. So what can we in the academy do? We can all work with local and national refugee organizations. <clears throat> Students can use their social media to spread the word and help change the dominant images of refugees. Scholars can explore, examine, analyze, and critique the global refugee crisis in courses and conferences in their writings. Ours can be a praxis wrought in the crucible of our concrete academic work, specific counteracts that reach out to those who are in this global struggle for freedom from oppression and for their human rights. Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through a continuous struggle, said Martin Luther King, and so we must straighten our backs and work for our freedom. The freedom of refugees is also our freedom. Their rights are our rights. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? And this applies not only to the refugee crisis, but to our own engaged, productive, curricular, and scholarly work on behalf of LOTE, the humanities indeed are humanity. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so our next speaker is Charlotte Maline. She's a professor of German at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And her work crosses over um, quite a few different areas actually of literary studies and second language um, education. But one of her primary areas of interest, as was already mentioned, um, both for teaching and research has been in the environmental humanities. Uh, in addition to several articles that she's written, um, for example, on poetry, and in particular post-war poetry from the perspective of eco-criticism, um, she's co-authored a piece that I found particularly interesting entitled Claiming the Language Ecotone, Translinguality, Resilience, and the Environmental Humanities. And she's also been involved in research initiatives on our campus, and we're going to hear a little bit about those today um, that are related to the environmental humanities um, as another kind of um, anchor for thinking transdisciplinarily about the work that we do. She's also currently editing a collection of essays, Foreign Language Teaching and the Environment, Theory, Curricula, Institutional Structures, uh, and she told me, and I was delighted to hear, that it's coming out actually in October, so next month, and you can pre-order it already on the MLA website if you're excited about what she shares, which I'm sure you will be. Um, so please join me in welcoming Charlotte Maline. I want to make a disclaimer at the start of this. This is going to be a slightly more granular talk than what we heard. It's I want to get into thinking about how do we actually start changing the curriculum. And so I'll be giving examples from my own experience. In Minnesota, we do not typically talk our, about ourselves. We talk about others. So when I'm doing that, I'm not thinking of this as a special example. I'm thinking it, about it as a transferable template that will give you ideas for what you might want to do at your own institution. And I also want to say that knowing colleagues well in the German department, I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle. When I said that phrase to a younger colleague um, several weeks ago, I was greeted with a blank stare, and I realized that I was working out of the extractive cultures in which I grew up. We might think about that in terms of language and how we think about talking about the environment. So let me start. Programs in languages, literatures, and cultures thrive on innovation, such as a transdisciplinary turn that connects language programs with the expansion on our campuses of environmental humanities research and teaching. That kind of innovation, a response attuned to the pressing concerns of our times, carries with it an acknowledgement of our responsibilities to students. It's also shaped by our hope that transformation will make our programs more sustainable. For me, an overriding sense of urgency about environmental matters has driven many of the curricular experiments and programmatic innovations that I've launched in the past decade. While I see many ways to affect institutional change and deeply value the aesthetic, cultural, and literary traditions of my research areas, I've concluded that environmental thinking, broadly defined, is an absolutely essential component of the 21st century educational landscape. 
To make the case for what that might mean for your programs and curricula, my talk will start today with the rationale for this turn, an overview and an overview of projects I have pursued. I will then offer a preview of some of the approaches laid out in the book I've edited for the Modern Language Association, and as Chantal mentioned, this is Foreign Language Teaching in the Environment, Theory, Curricula, Institutional Structures. I had hoped to have a copy by today. It's not here, but I've been told it will be here in October. So pre-order if you are interested once you see what the essays are, and I'll show you that at the end. Like many experiments, it was not clear to me at the outset where the path I'm on would lead when I embarked on this current trajectory a decade ago. As you contemplate innovation on your own campus, let me stress that small incremental change is often the starting point for broader transformations. On my campus, and we're generally in Minnesota, Colleagues have been thinking for years about what sustainability slash environmental education might look like and how those efforts could involve the humanities in a meaningful way. These dialogues were in part inspired by publications like The Nature of College by the late James J. Farrell of St. Olaf College, as well as the work of David Orr, Christopher Uhl, and others um, listed on your bi short bibliography. Farrell observed in his book that college is a place where students can think twice about American culture and ecosystems. Today, we navigate an ever wider ecosystem that calls for an understanding of the complex dimensions of societies that fully recognizes the profound interdependence of human cultures and nature. The rationale for exploring ways for language programs to engage in cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary collaborations has never been stronger or more urgent, given the fresh range of, cha range of challenges in areas where language expertise pertains, from climate change and resource sharing to social justice issues and global migration. We did not share our talks in advance, but there's overlap here. <clears throat> In 2019, our teaching and research takes place against the backdrop of reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that have led the United Nations to conclude that climate change is the defining issue of our time, and we are at a defining moment. Pragmatically, our institutions grapple with environmental and technology realities that are steadily reshaping our work. Short-term disruptions like class cancellations that have resulted in the past two years from Hurricane Florence in the Carolinas, the Camp Fire in California, the polar vortex in the upper Midwest, confront us with the precarity of things we take for granted in contemporary life. These forces remind us vividly that the pursuit of knowledge is bound up with tangible work to create habitable futures. Such realities are the new normal that current undergraduates, undergraduates will negotiate for their entire lives. LEED certified buildings, renewable energy installations, and recycling sort systems dot the campuses of colleges and universities serving as constant reminders of the extent to which the sciences have become a daily part of our world. Yet, both we and our increasingly diverse students, many of whom aspire to become STEM majors, crave the aesthetic pleasure afforded by the study of languages, literatures, and cultures, the unique ways of knowing that the humanities offer, as Dan Philippon argues. Bringing language programs into con in to conversation with the environmental humanities and sciences has the potential to reposition our fields within the educational enterprise as a whole, liberating us from the constraints of a curriculum improvised merely to meet course requirement checklists. That move comes with an unexpected ripple effect. 
So let me talk about faculty innovators and curricular change. To be blunt, we must not allow ourselves to be content with intellectual discussions of the rationale for action when change is desperately needed. The curriculum is where the faculty have immediate control and the ability to innovate if they choose to do so. On my campus in the wake of the 2008 economic crisis, administrators talked about shovel-ready projects that could attract stimulus funds. We need to be thinking that way again. And however vulnerable we feel ourselves to be, we in the foreign languages have had similar imperatives. Janet Swaffer and Catherine Ahrens' remapping the foreign language curriculum and the 2007 MLA's report, report with its resounding call for translingual and transcultural competence in connection with deep educational reform. What that has meant for me personally, situated between research projects, fully promoted with a generic course to plan for the next semester, was that the time was right 10 years ago for change, and so was the context. Having just completed a term as chair, I was also well acquainted with the strategic re reasons for making reform moves. In aggregate, most of our majors and minors and continuing students have academic concentrations in STEM or policy-related areas. That concentration of interests argued for realignment of our curriculum to bring it in line with potential student demand. And here I just want to outline some of those strategic considerations briefly. So we could develop integrative projects that would cut across many different disciplines. We could think about our student body in terms of their diverse interests. We could think about the changes that were occurring in foreign language teaching being discussed by colleagues here at the University of Arizona in part. And we could also think about the drive toward career readiness and more study abroad that's going on on many campuses. So my first step was to return to a literary and scholarly interest that I'd long had, nature poetry. This sounds far away from what we're talking about. And then to embark on the redesign of undergraduate courses of two kinds generic language literature course offerings, and a large enrollment course in English. So I'll just move to this slide. Now whenever I teach a generic course in German, be it an introduction to literature, advanced conversation and composition, or contemporary issues offering, I intentionally focus it on representations of nature, or environmental topics, or sustainability practices. Germany is known for being green, despite uh, auto emissions scandals. And most undergraduates today have heard enough about that reputation to be curious. Reaching out to the fledgling sustainability studies minor on campus, housed in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, I found colleagues happy to advertise my courses because their students were desperately seeking electives. Indeed, a number of faculty who work internationally and even themselves use languages were willing to come to my class as guest experts. So if you look here, what you'll notice is the first course that I redid was a literature course. It happened to include a work by Krista Wolf, um, a, an East German author who wrote about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in her novella, um, Stofal, Accident. And while teaching this course, the earthquake happened in Japan. So I immediately transformed the way that I was teaching to speak to the interests of students that were developing around this. The other thing that you're going to notice is that as I moved through changing a number of different courses, I also found opportunities to collaborate with other types of students in other ways. And that's part of part of what my story, I think, will show you um, about changing the curriculum. Eventually, I developed a lecture course for general audiences, a class format I had never imagined myself teaching. With the title, Thinking Environment, Green Culture, German Literature, and Global Debates, 
and a double general education certification for literature and environment, it draws enrollments from multiple colleges beyond the College of Liberal Arts, which is my home department. Um, and that enhances our tuition revenues. Both the Sustainability Studies minor and the Carlson School of Management, our business school, have added it to their recommended electives. And enrollments tend to range between 30, which is about what I have right now, a little over 30, and 60 students, partly depending on uh, the political climate at the moment. So this is a large enrollment course for my type of department. It's also a course that is cross-listed as an undergraduate graduate offering. And I think that intersection between undergraduate and graduate education is extremely important for all of us. As a result, I find myself constantly drawing on a rich array of collaborations with faculty and graduate students. So um, we'll take a look at some more of that in a bit. Um, Multiple opportunities for co-teaching with faculty have resulted in network connections. And thanks to the support of German and European studies, my colleague Dan Philippon and I in English have been able to co-teach an international graduate seminar and advanced graduate student workshop. So part of how this has happened has been through the creation of a website for the Green German Project and this is a, is a project that has been shared with our college and the schools participating teachers. So this is now a group of 26 high schools that use our curriculum. We've done workshops for them so that they understand how to work with these materials. And then it has been filtered out through professional development workshops to teachers in Minnesota, to um, teachers in the AATG, to groups that have been convened by the Goethe Institute in, Co in Chicago, and a number of my colleagues have also participated in offering this work, these types of workshops. So it hasn't just been an individual project, it's, it's really had a ripple effect that I never could have anticipated. In fact, one of the things that's happening now is one of my collaborators, Dr. Beth Kautz, has translated this into an idea for a study abroad course that will take place on our campus and then in Germany in the spring entitled Sustainability in Ger Germany. And so um, there are different ways to think about pushing, pushing the ideas forward and multiplying the impact of this kind of initiative, which started very, very small with an undergraduate research project with me. So, um, so thinking now about this, the graduate student um, faculty component of this, the Institute for Advanced Study and multiple faculty interest groups and workshops have helped us to develop an intellectual community that eventually made possible the launch of the Environmental Humanities Initiative, which I now co-facilitate with Phil Dan Philippon in the Chair of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, Christine Moran. The College of Liberal Arts has provided us with support, which we hope will be sustained over time, particularly because of the num a number of the projects that we undertake, like the Transatlantic Summer Institute, which are funded very well by external sources, the DAD, German Academic Exchange, and other funding agencies. So what we've done with the, at the graduate student level is we've started, there was a faculty seminar that was convening in 2011 that I participated in that included graduate students and all sorts of faculty from across the university. Out of that, we then began to realize that there was a core group of humanities scholars working in this area, and that was the seed for the network. We then moved from that to this, trans to this transatlantic environmental humanities course that I co-taught with my colleague Dan Philippon. We did that in collaboration with the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. Um, their students came over for a week. Our students went over there for a week during Thanksgiving. This was all funded by the German Academic Exchange and supported by the Center for um, German and European Studies. So it's, it's kind of a model research project for them. It's a research collaborative, such as we've been doing 
on my campus for many years now. And then when, once we received funding from the Col College of Liberal Arts for the Environmental Humanities Initiative, we used that to leverage funding from other areas to bring in speakers. When, when a department was bringing in a speaker who had some connection to what we were doing, we would advertise that. So a lot of this is really networking, not so much independent funding to make it happen. It's, it's a lot of um, on-the-ground legwork but it, it gets the network built up. So let me talk a little bit about this transatlantic, uh, the Environmental Humanities Initiative and the Transatlantic Summer Institute. So the Environmental Humanities Initiative, this is a picture that was put into the uh, CLA, College of Liberal Arts, 150th anniversary celebration catalog. And the portrait was done by a respected photographic artist in Minnesota, shows um, a number of our students who had been on this transatlantic seminar going to Germany, coming back to the United States, and who have continued to be part of the Environmental Humanities Initiative. Those students have then been pushing out some of these ideas into their departments because they've been doing dissertations that focus on environmental humanities topics. And when they do that, then they also transfer it into the type of teaching that they're doing. So when we teach the teachers, we're teaching the next generation that will be carrying out this kind of work. Um, the focus of our particular collaborative, because we're, we're coming from many different departments, has been um, graduate research and education, most uh, environmental sustainability studies um, clusters have been more focused on the undergraduate level, so we push this up to the graduate level. And we've also been thinking a lot about the transnational aspects of this because environmental issues know no borders, right? So this, this is something that we've really wanted to push. At this point, we have about 50 affiliated faculty. Some are more closely affiliated with us than other groups. And we've also gotten a lot of support from the Institute for Advanced Study, which helps seed fund some of our initial projects. Another part of this has been the, the ability to offer workshops for graduate students. So last a year ago in June, um, my colleague Dan Philippon on the far right there and I, um, together with Frank Uckerhoff from um, the University of Birmingham in the, United, in the UK, um, we taught for two weeks a transatlantic summer institute. This was intended for graduate students at the point working on their dissertations who had environmental humanities topics. We ended up having a few students who were at a, er, an earlier stage, but that was really important too. So one of these students, for example, now this year is over at the Rachel Carson Center, in part because there were Rachel Carson Center students who came to this institute. One of our students who had been at the Rachel Carson Center to work on her dissertation, and there's this nice intellectual exchange now going on internationally that's been very enriching for all of us. We invited in uh, guest speakers to talk about their particular research areas. You can see from the diversity of individuals included here that um, it meant that we had people talking about issues that we ourselves could not talk about. Both Dan and I are more literary scholars. Dan also does um, creative writing, so it's a different sort of orientation, but very important in the environmental humanities field is the idea that everyone is welcome. Everyone has something to contribute in, in this sort of project. So let me talk a little bit about maybe next stages and what, what gets this type of project going. While our intellectual work as faculty collaborators is often adjacent to rather than directly connected with individual programs in language, literature, and culture, it is vitally important for the renewal of higher education and for the creation of sustainable configurations in the humanities. Key catalysts that emerge from our scholarly, professional, and personal connections include intellectual impetus coming from engaging with the work of field-shaping scholars, 
on my campus, reading groups, seminars, and workshops have explored a wealth of new directions in the environmental humanities. The work of historian Maria Cristina Garcia on climate refugees, Ursula K. Heise's Imagining Extinction, the Cultural Meaning of Endangered Species, Timothy Morton's Hyper Objects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, along with other publications in the University of Minnesota Press series and social justice principles articulated in Rob Nixon's Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. This is, intersects very well with the migration and refugee issues that we just heard about as well. And there are a number of titles on your bibliography that will start to point you in those directions. Like the flagship professional organization, ASLI, the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, we take a big tent approach and welcome scholars from all fields. Um, what matters is common interest and willingness to share ideas. The drivers of curricular change often have similar origin. When we share information and know that models already exist for the teaching that we do, it becomes easier to create openings. That was my primary motivation for developing foreign languages and the environment, which I want to turn to now. Look, there's even a book cover, <laughs> which is even better. Um, what I learned from my collaboration with the authors of the 15 assembled essays is that there are highly diverse models for innovation in every variety of the language department. Most fit, fit fairly easily within traditional categories for language, literature, and culture courses. Many embrace new pedagogies ranging from post-communicative, content-based, and multi-literacies approaches to design thinking. So here are some examples. Some are well-funded, others spring up in the midst of scarce resources. Some serve particular audiences, advanced business Chinese, Russian flagship students, and communities of indigenous languages in the upper Midwest. Others build on the platform of literary and cultural studies for courses with broad appeal about deserts and migration in Francophone literature, rainforests and toxic landscapes in Latin America, social responsibility in Japan in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, in any number of content areas. Water, food, living situations, transportation, urban environments, lifestyle choices, many of the potential topics are already frequently addressed in language courses. Throughout our curriculum, there are natural points of intersection with environmental issues, sustainability practices, and STEM fields, but this is not all about STEM. It's really about humanities values. And collaborations abound. Professors of Russian and biological sciences at Wellesley College devised an undergraduate research and study abroad program at Lake Baikal. At Virginia Commonwealth University, community engagement which worked through existing Richmond Sister Cities connections to French West Africa, played an important role in attracting humanitarian projects funded by the Gates Foundation and considerable resources. The institutional models represented here, and this is the third section of the book, include the well-known example of Emory University's Piedmont Project and also range to the impressive work being done at Small Wofford College, a liberal arts institution in S South Carolina, by colleagues in Chinese, French, German, and Spanish who have pushed for curricular reform in relation to the creation of an interdisciplinary environmental studies program. Yet the essays in this collection represent only a small slice of what could be done. And I organized a, a session at MLA last winter that now will be resulting in papers that are coming out in the ADF bulletin uh, very soon as well to talk about other possible models for this. 
Language programs may well look for inspiration to many other sectors of environmental humanities. The work of ecolinguists, now concerned with the disappearance of indigenous languages with the burning of the Amazon, of empirical eco-criticism scholars using the methodologies of the digital humanities to analyze the impact of cli-fi reading. This is very similar to a lot of the work that's being done in second language acquisition, the quantitative and qualitative analysis. And the work of eco-theorists developing the critical interventions of material eco-criticism, which help us interpret anew the relationship between text and the world that surrounds us. Um, and here you'll see a reference to Iovino and Obermann on, on your bibliography. So I've reached my conclusion, and that's good because I'm running out of time. Why take the potential step, or the potential risk of stepping outside of our faculty comfort zone in this way when it comes to curriculum? Other disciplines, especially STEM fields, need us because their students do. We in the humanities do not provide the solutions for climate change in the 21st century. Even so, we are profoundly attuned to its vast implications. We explore the complex interrelationship of culture, society, and other aspects of the public sphere by practicing forms of knowledge production that are materially grounded in the language that we teach and also in the texts and stories that we have to tell. This capacity makes us intrinsically relevant. We address complex issues from multiple perspectives, insist on the importance of history, and articulate ethical values related to the common good, all while navigating the nuances of language and speculative aesthetic worlds. What we are doing when we teach today's students is preparing them, we hope, to be global citizens who are leaders, interpreters, and caring fellow inhabitants of the earth. As the climate warms, sea levels rise, global migration accelerates, and a host of other changes occur that will fundamentally alter current lifestyles. We as faculty members and departments have, in my view, a responsibility to be change agents, even when we have doubts about the impact we make. Ironically, the greatest challenge of work toward curricular transformation is perhaps simply taking the first step because it requires faith in the potential benefits of change. To put it another way, we face difficult choices that follow from an inconvenient question that could be transformative. 10 years from now, what will our students remember when they, about the time they spend in our classes? If the answer turns out to be that we inspired them to hopeful action, Perhaps we will witness them in our classrooms and beyond, growing an intellectual curiosity to become truly global citizens who surpass us in their ability to integrate humanities, STEM, and other perspectives. Let us hope.